growing shortage of drinkable water is causing problems around the world. China is drying up. Water is running out. This is out. Sao Paulo's main water the reservoir. reservoir. In the region are drying it's a crisis up. few would expect a water in 21st crisis century that is America. From bad to worse. Most people don't know that we're going to run out of water, usable water. And the World Economic Forum has rated water the number one risk to global society. But to bring awareness to this for the rest of the world, you're going to run the equivalent of 40 marathons, seven deserts, seven continents in just seven weeks to raise awareness. water crisis. That's despite being once told she'd never run again after breaking her back. She'll run across seven deserts on seven continents in just seven weeks. Ladies and gents, a warm round of applause for the amazing Minaguli. Hello everyone. I've got to tell you it's a bit of a shock to be here. Um, there's the most p number of people I've seen in about five weeks. So I've spent the last five weeks with desert sand, with polar expedition, and um, I'm having a bit of culture shock being here. I'm also having culture shock being here because it took a bit of an effort to get here. Uh, yesterday I was stranded on a border um, between Namibia and South Africa trying to get across and the irony is that water scarcity had caused a river to be so low that I couldn't get across in the vehicle. The pontoon had been closed for the season so I kayaked across the border, wrote down on my immigration form method of transport kayak. <laughs> They had the nerve to ask me what the number was of my kayak. I'm like that orange one over there sitting on the beach. <laughs> um, seriously, it's great to be here and it's, a, it's really great to talk to you about something I'm very, very passionate about. Something that has caused me to step out of my corporate career, to start a non-profit, to give my life to something that I hope will really affect and impact all of you by the end of our conversation today. So. In the last 38 days, I have run 29 marathons. If you'd ask me... <laughs> if you'd asked me 20 years ago, was I capable of this, I would have said no chance on this green earth. At the age of 22, I was pushed into a swimming pool and I broke a vertebrae in my back. And the doctors told me I'd never be able to run again. Rather than sit back and say, great excuse to never have to run, great excuse to do nothing, I took this as an incentive and I started saying, well, maybe I'll swim and bike and run because who is anybody else to set a limit on me other than me? I am the one to say what I can and can't do. So I started running and I ran some more and I ran some more and I ran some more. And I never would have believed that I could run Six marathons across the Tabernas Desert in Spain, followed by seven marathons across the Arabian Desert in Jordan, followed by five, de five marathons across the Polar Desert in Antarctica, seven across the Simpson Desert in Australia, and four across the Richtersfeld in South Africa, finishing yesterday. Okay. <laughs> I'm not an athlete, right? People laugh when I say that, but I'm really not an athlete. I'm just like you guys. It's just that I'm totally and utterly determined and focused to solve a global problem. I have a dream, a great big dream, and it revolves around water, and it revolves around making sure that we have enough water for everyone on this planet forever. So I wanna just talk to you a bit about that, and I wanna talk to you about it in the context of the people and the experiences I've had over the last five weeks. Okay, this is not about textbooks. This is about the people and the stories of what's going on on the ground in different places. So I'm running. I'm running not because of some like romantic reason about, oh, I can you know, change the world. Well, that's a bit of it. But the way I want to change the world is by uniting people, by taking the stories of people on the ground in different places, highlighting them, and showing people everywhere that through collective human spirit and ingenuity, we can solve some of the biggest problems on the planet. We can overcome odds. We can face global extinction in the face, and we can win. This is my goal. 
So let me tell you about some of the people I've met, some of the stories, and some of the things that they've told me. And I've got to tell you, my experience in doing this has been phenomenal because I read about water scarcity on pages. I've read about it on the internet. But I have seen things in the last five weeks that have shocked me to the core and made me even more inspired to do something to solve this problem. So, I've taken water from a well. This is in the Arabian Desert in Jordan, where we were without water for one whole day. We went from well to well. We looked everywhere to find water, and we couldn't find water. Eventually, some of the locals said, actually, we know of a well a couple of hills down and valleys across. If we go there, we'll be able to find water. We finally found water, and I can't begin to tell you what it is like to spend a whole day not knowing where you're going to be able to find some water to drink. That's reality. Llevo un poco, de, sí, llevo, llevo años, bastante años. Antes era más productiva que hoy. Se están yendo el agua, se está perdiendo todo. Y luego, que se saca mucha cantidad de agua. Sí, saben que hay un problema y que, y que bueno, que la única solución es concienciarse en que el agua es para lo que hay. Y, y bueno, y no hay otra. La base fundamental es concienciar un poco a la gente porque tenemos que dejar esos hábitos, si no, lo vamos a pasar mal. I, I know in some streets in, in Amman, they get water like once a month. Because Amman is growing too fast, especially the last five years, because of the refu refugees. Refugees from Iraq, refugees from Palestine, from Syria. أما لما أجينا على المخيم صرنا نفكر بتوفير المي هذا شيء شيء كثير كويس لأن إحنا نصير نوفر بالمي لأنه معروف عن بلد الأردن هو بلد شحيح بالمياه نحن لازم نوفر مشاننا ومشان غيرنا صح تجي المي كمية قليلة بس نحن بنوفر فيها شلون يعني مثلاً نشطف بالمي Reality check. That was my first desert of Spain. It's like, wow, I can't believe I'm really here and I'm really doing this thing. I probably should have thought about this a bit better beforehand. <laughs> um, I think that the reality of actually doing what I'm doing didn't set in until about three days before we left. And I was at an interview with the BBC and they were talking about how hard it was going to be. You know, Mina, you're going to all these extreme places. It's going to be boiling hot and freezing cold. And I thought to myself, wow, that's actually true. It's going to be kind of extreme and crazy. And what am I thinking? And how am I going to adapt to 60 degrees difference? So when I got to Spain, it was a massive reality check. The running was hard. It was dusty. It was hilly. And anybody who's run will tell you dusty, hilly, sandy environments are tough to run in. But what was really, really amazing for me were some of the people I'd met. When I was in a dim, dark place, only on the third day, um, I've been to some pretty horrible places over the last five weeks, internally, emotionally, and physically. And on the third day in, and I knew I still had 37 marathons to go, I was running through a place called Rioja, which is in, um, in the Tabernas Desert in Spain. And a farmer um, who had collections of these really ripe, juicy oranges gave me an orange and opened it for me. There was juice spurting out everywhere. One of the most juiciest, tastiest oranges I'd ever had. And there were tomatoes and all sorts of beautiful, fresh fruit. And I looked at him and we talked about it. And I said, you know, how is it that your, your fruit is so juicy? How is it that your fruit is so perfect? And he said to me two things. The first of all is that they sell their fruit by weight. So they are actively encouraged to overwater their crops. The second is that we need perfect fruit to be able to sell at high prices. So most of the fruit that we produce is actually left on the ground. These oranges that you're taking now are actually not the oranges we normally sell. These are the oranges that get left behind. Perfectly good fruit. Turns out two thirds of the world's food gets thrown away before we even get to it. Two thirds of the world's food is wasted. 
Think about that, because 70% of the world's water is used in agriculture. In Jordan, second desert, Jordan has the third least water available in the world. It's a country running out of water really, really fast. On the second day in Jordan, so now we're eight marathons down, we stopped at about the 23 kilometer mark and we met some local Bedouins. And these Bedouins are living in the, in the desert, under canopies, in a pretty tough environment. They actually live in an area that was given to Jordan in 2002, which exchanged 55 kilometers of coastline for 15 kilometers and gave up rights to a town called Aquaba, which has a huge water resource underneath. So, coastline for water. What was interesting to me about this was that these people knew exactly what had happened, and they were very aware of the water crisis. In fact, Yusuf, this guy right on this picture here, said to us one thing I'm going to tell you, it really made an impact on me. He said, 91% of Jordan is desert, without rivers, without lakes, without streams. In fact, for me, many of the places I ran in Jordan were empty riverbeds. Riverbeds that had been not only empty for days, but weeks, years, centuries. By 2025, it's estimated that the number of amount of water per person will have dropped from 160 to 90 square meters per person. It's a problem because they've got massive numbers of refugees coming across the border and more and more demand for a dwindling water supply. As Yusuf said, the question is not, will the water run out in Jordan? It is when. Perhaps it will be in my lifetime, but it will definitely be in my children's lifetime. I fear that World War III will not be because of terrorism or oil, but because of water. That's the view of the people on the ground in Jordan. From Jordan to Antarctica. Most people don't think of Antarctica as being a desert. And it was a weird thing to be running on top of a polar ice cap representing a big portion of the 90% of the world's water that is fresh. Antarctica was cold, it was windy, it was desolate. There were days when I couldn't differentiate between the sky and the ground. There were days when I couldn't see the ground. The light in Antarctica does weird things and it refracts off the, off the, off the ground that you're running on. So when you're running on completely white, in a white environment, you can't get any depth perception. So you run blind. It's the first time I really understood what it might be like to not have eyesight, to really be at one with your senses. It's the first time in my life I have been devoid of everything except the sound of my own heartbeat. And that environment allows you to reflect. And one of the things I was reflecting on was what work is being done in Antarctica and what are the stories that Antarctica can tell us about the weather, about water and about water supply. Antarctica and particularly the Australian research base down in Antarctica is doing a huge amount of work on the interaction between climate change and water and particularly about the impact of changing weather patterns on water supplies around the world. And their view is, the view of these absolute world-class scientists, there's going to be a massive impact between the weather patterns and the changing weather conditions and changing water supplies. And in fact, the more I went to people on the ground in these deserts, the more I realized that this science is bearing out on the ground. Rivers are drying up. People are having problems with water supply where they never had problems before. This is a weather balloon I, I was fortunate enough to let off, which is part of a global project to try to understand global movement of weather and global, changing global weather patterns. It's extremely linked to water security and water supply. Minus 20 degrees in Antarctica when I got on the plane and flew out and landed in the Simpson Desert at plus 47 degrees Celsius. I felt like I had my head in an oven with the fan on. It was so hot, I can't even begin to tell you. And a desert that I thought would be my homecoming and all exciting and wonderful and fantastic ended up being an absolute test of will. And it was a test of will because I was running in sand dunes, ankle deep sand, bright red, complete contrast to Antarctica. 
Antarctica, we'd lost time because uh, we'd lost two days. The weather had been so bad in Antarctica, we couldn't fly down. So by the time I got to Australia, I'd had a week and a bit of trying to make up miles. We'd been running in Antarctica late, late into the night. Antarctica, you probably know, at this time of year, only has four hours of darkness. So that's great, okay? It means you can run all day and all night. But it's really bad because it means you get no sleep. So by the time I arrived in Australia, I was exhausted and tired and had pretty much had enough of this whole thing, but knew that just like I am, tired and worn out, there is something bigger than me that is driving this. So when I got to the Simpson Desert, I set about understanding better the thing that drives me, water. And one of the things I was amazed about in the Simpson Desert is how much water actually lies underground and particularly how the Aboriginal communities have lived in synergy with this water supply. As one of the ladies at a small community said to me, um, the community is called Tichikala, her name was Emily, and Emily said to me, Mina, you think water is important. Water is life. Without it, we die. Tough conditions, tough situations, covered in flies, 47 degrees, running through ankle deep, bright red sand all day, every day. These are conditions in which people are living. These are conditions of water scarcity, places where there isn't enough water to sustain communities long term, particularly if we don't look after it. I wanted to run in Australia because Australia is my hometown. Australia has great examples of places where the government has taken it upon themselves to really manage water basins, shared water basins. Places like the Murray-Darling, which, which runs between two different Australian states. And the Australian government has created world-class, world-leading policy exchanges and policy debates and policy management systems to manage this water supply. 70% of Australia is now classified as arid, semi-arid or desert environment. They have a problem, and Australia has taken it on, and they're making every effort to try to manage it. For me, important lessons to learn, especially as I then move to the Richtersfeld in South Africa. Now, the Richtersfeld is on the southern tip of the Namib Desert, running between the Namibia and South Africa, which is why I got stuck paddling in my kayak across between the border. Um, Richtersfeld is a really interesting environment. It is a place where they get 38 millimetres of, 3.8 millimetres of rain, less than half a centimetre of rain each year. There are plants and animals that have adapted to this environment. Spiders, little cacti, microscopic organisms. We met a guy called Peter in the Richtersfeld Desert. Peter is 23 years old. He's already discovered 14 different new species in the Richtersfeld Desert. 14 species that have adapted to these incredibly harsh environments in one way or another. The Richtersfeld is the most biodiverse place on the planet. It is dry. It is incredibly dry. There are rocks, stones and sand everywhere. I was actually here running. This is me running yesterday, literally yesterday. Uh, right before kayaking, and you know, but um, we're running up along ridge tops, looking down at valleys completely devoid, apparently, of vegetation until you get close down. You know, sometimes I think you need to take away the big things to see the small things. I spend a lot of time enjoying the beauty of trees and the beauty of big things, and it wasn't until all of those things are gone that I was forced to look at the rocks. I was forced to understand the geology. I was forced to understand the role that insects and plants and microscopic organisms can play in our society. These things can tell us stories, and they can also tell us lessons in how we can adapt to different environments, because adaptation for us is going to be everything. This is all great. It's what's even greater is that we've had huge traction from what we've been doing. In fact, almost one billion people have seen our messages through media, social media, online and offline media. Almost one billion people on the planet have seen what we've been doing. And it's awesome, but it's not enough. It's only one tiny, weeny little drop in a very big bucket. And I'll tell you why. 
Water scarcity has been ranked as the, by the World Economic Forum as the number one risk facing our society, not just now, but for the next decade. When I think about that and when I read it in the book, I think, oh, wow, that's kind of cool, but it's just you know, another line item on an accounting report. It's just something for everybody else to think about. We think about water as turning on a tap and the water comes out. But actually, that's not the problem. The problem is much bigger. Water scarcity is real, and it's going to affect us in lots of different ways. 15 years from now, there will be a 40% greater demand for water than the supply available. That's why I chose 40 marathons. If you look red, look at the red. This is what's going to happen. We have a problem. Water scarcity is on our doorstep, and it's not going away anytime soon. And the impact of that is going to be massive. In Sao Paulo, in 2015, it ran out of water. For four days, they had no water. No water. Not just a little bit of water, no water. There were protests and riots and mass panic. Rising costs of production of food and produce caused panic around the world. This is a sign of things to come. I think about California and think about the almond industry in California draining the water supplies. Did you know that all the water that's used to produce the almonds in California is enough to, for the entire city of Los Angeles for 1,405 years? We have a problem. We're using water faster than it can be replenished. And we're using it in our lifetime. This is not something that we can kick down the path and say it's 100 years from now. I know where I'm going to be 15 years from now, and I bet you most of you do too. This is not something that we can leave for future generations. This is the problem of our generation, and it is the problem for your kids and your grandkids and their grandkids. Because if we can't solve this water problem, what is the future? We can't wait. We cannot afford to wait. This is something we need to address now. It's getting worse, and we need to make a change. So this all seems like doom and gloom. And when I go to the ground and I see the guys in the Richtersfeld yesterday when we were talking about crossing this river, you know, this river six years ago was six meters higher than it is now. The guys on this river, it's called the Orange River, it's one of the main rivers in South Africa, predict that by the end of this month, it will no longer reach the Atlantic Ocean. The signs are there. We need to do something now. I want a world where there's enough water for everyone forever. I want enough water that your kids and your grandkids can achieve their dreams, where we don't worry about where we're getting our next drink, where you don't have to go through what I went through in the Jordanian desert for a day without water. I want a world where we can have what we need to have. I can tell you all the reasons why that's not possible. Political reasons, tactical reasons, money reasons, politics. The issue is, it's actually not those reasons which, which are stopping us. The thing that's stopping us is actually us. And that's kind of good news, because that means that we change, we can change the future. So, here's the situation. 70% of the world's water goes into agriculture, 20% into manufacturing, and 10% into domestic consumption. Think about this. Each one of you is wearing really nice outfits, probably leather shoes, cotton pants, shirts, jacket. You probably had a coffee for breakfast. You're sitting there with a mobile phone tucked in the pocket and a laptop in your bag. All of those things for each one of you took more water to make than all the water you've drunk in your whole lifetime. Yeah, all the water in the things that you're wearing today took more water to make than all the water you've drunk in your whole lifetime. That's kind of frightening, but it also means that we can make a change. It also means that we can, by our purchasing choices, change the way that we use and consume water. Almost all of you have the capacity to make that change through your companies, through individual choice. We can make a difference. We can create a world where there's enough water for everyone forever. I think this is possible. I know this is possible. And I know this is possible for three reasons. 
The first is that each one of you is in a position to be able to make change, either through your own choices or by looking at different ways in which you can use water more sustainably, through your companies, through the people you work with, through the companies you work with. Almost all of you are getting supplied with something from someone by someone. You are connected to these water problems on the ground. Yesterday, when we were, I was running, we came out of the Richtersfeld, and part of the Richtersfeld uh, in the Namibia side, there is a huge tract of land covered in grapes, grape plantations. They are draining this river, up river from where I couldn't cross because it's too low, up river from where they say that they're no longer going to be joining into the Atlantic Ocean, are massive plantations of grapes. And the head of nature and protection of nature at this grape plantation said to me, you know what, Mina? The sad thing is grapes aren't food. Grapes are luxury. And I thought to myself, he's absolutely right. Doesn't mean we can't have luxury. It doesn't mean we can't have grapes. But we need to think carefully about the impact of what we're doing, the choices that we're making. Buy grapes from places that are water. Buy coffee beans from places where there's plenty of water to grow coffee. Buy almonds from places there are plenty of water to grow almond trees. But we need to be more understanding of the, of the impact of what we're doing on the supply chains and on the impact of things on the ground. So why do I think we can change this problem? I think we can change this problem because of all of you. And I think that we can change this problem because of consumers. I think that people can influence companies, and I think companies can influence suppliers, and I think suppliers can make changes on the ground. And I know that to be the case, because when you go and talk to a lot of these suppliers, they know they have a problem. They see it. They see the rivers going down. I also know that we're going to succeed because of people just like these kids. I run a nonprofit in China, and we educate hundreds of thousands of kids. We're expanding around the world. Kids get it. You go and talk to your kids or your grandkids, and ask them about water, they understand. They get it instantly and they want to make a change. From nothing in 2012, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of kids in our network. We have hundreds of schools, we have government participation. It has been phenomenal how kids have adopted this issue. And I know we're going to make a difference because of people like these, key opinion leaders and others. This is actually my team, um, taken on the top of one of our rocks in, in, Pet, in Jordan. And they and others, key opinion leaders around the world are making a change. They're taking a pledge to do one thing to reduce their water consumption. For example, taking a pledge to drink tea over coffee and save the equivalent of five minutes in a shower. Or to go vegetarian for a lunch and save the equivalent of two hours in a shower. I bet you didn't know that if you eat a beef burger, it's the same amount of water that's used to do that as spending two hours in a shower. Scary numbers. Or they're choosing to drink beer over wine. Beer takes less wine to produce them than wine. So drink beer. Um, the point is that Every person that makes a commitment, every person that shares, every person that talks about saving water, shares the message about water. Together, we start to create momentum. And this is the third reason why I think that we will create change, because we are already starting. The momentum has started. Running around the world, we are joining people together to find solutions to a common problem, and that problem is water. That problem is water scarcity. And the issue is to find ways to join all of us together to say, we can not only be the problem. We can actually be the solution. Each of us making a change, fueled by the strength and commitment of others, makes a big impact. Tomorrow I'm going to be running across the Atacama Desert in Chile. And next week I'm going to be running across the Mojave Desert in Death Valley in California, which is my final desert. I just think Death Valley is such an epic way to finish. Um, I'm doing this for one reason, seven deserts, seven continents in seven weeks, 40 marathons, finishing on World Water Day, 22nd of March. I'm going through the hardship, the difficulty, the physical, emotional and mental challenges. And I'm doing this because I believe we can be the solution. I believe that by uniting the young people of the world together, to find a common solution to this problem, we can make a difference. I believe that each one of us can make a small change. Each one of us can take a small step. Each one of us together can join
to make a global community that is working together to find a solution to the world's biggest issue, the issue confronting all of us, and that is water. I think that small steps every single day can make a massive difference. And I know that because every single drop counts. Thank you.